Welcome to the inaugural In Real Life podcast brought to you by the Big Picture Film Club, the podcast where we learn about our guests through the medium of film. And it's with great pleasure that I'm going to introduce to you our very first guest, because we always remember our first. It's LVC presenter Matt Stadlin. Hello, Matt. How are you? Hello. I like the idea of it being in real life, just in case that went over the heads of any of our listeners. Real. R-double-E-L. Absolutely. Mm. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to see you here. Are you okay with being on the other side of the microphone, as it were, and being asked the questions? I'm slightly nervous about that. You're nervous about it, or I'm <laughs> nervous about it. I'm the one who should be nervous about it. Although, having said that, when I'm on LBC, I have to give my own view on things. So it's not just asking questions of listeners who call in, who have the courage to call in. It's also telling them what I think, and with any luck, provoking them into calling in. It's a sort of double-edged sword there because you obviously need to accept other people's opinions and, and welcome them, but at the same time you'll have your own, naturally. Uh, how do you manage that? Well, I don't necessarily accept their opinions. I listen to their opinions and quite often disagree, but I think it is really, really important in these fractious and divided times in which we live that people with whom you disagree still get to have their voice heard. And I've taken probably about 8,000 calls from people up and down the country and also abroad, right around the world, from as distant a land as China or Australia. People or, call them from China. They really do. Amazing. Or west to America and to Canada. Everyone has got a story. Everyone has got a point of view. And far more than telling everyone what I think, I enjoy listening to what other people think. And of course, if someone does say something very provocative or controversial, well, it can make good radio, but I will try to persuade them of my view. But essentially, it's about listening to what you think, what other people think, and I find that really exciting. Mm. And how do you deal with the with the time with managing the time? I mean, your your slot is is it from one to five? It is from one to five in the morning, unless wow. I'm ste stepping in for one of my esteemed colleagues during the daylight hours. So this is the middle of the night for you. This is the middle of the Thank night, you very but much. <laughs> we well have done. an we have an extraordinarily wide audience base. So we can reach across my two weekend shows up to nearly 200,000 people when it's going really well. And that's quite an audience, isn't it? There are a lot of people who are awake at that time, surprisingly. And perhaps less surprisingly, a lot of people who want to listen to the radio because those quiet hours are some of the most intimate. In a way, it's what radio was made for, companionship. People love conversation. People love to listen to other people while they're doing what they're doing. And that may be tucked up under the duvet in the dark winter nights, or it may be keeping the economy ticking over by driving mm. an Uber or a black cab or, or doing security for a, for a company. Mm. In a, in a big building. So I love servicing those people, helping them to feel part of Britain's conversation. Thank you very much. Keep doing it. Let's talk Are about Are you listening? Do you ever listen, Jules? Come on. Do you ever I, ha do I get you? it on catch up. Okay. Promise. Right. I do get it on catch up. Come on. I've, told, I've, I've mentioned to you before that I've heard some of your shows. But as a young mum, mm. a young parent, yeah. when, when your little boy is awake in the middle of the night, that is the time He's good to speaker. tune. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> That's not good for my audience figures. I'm very pleased to hear it, though. When the next one arrives, you'll be hearing from me. Please. Don't you worry. But let's talk about your career. So you, you kind of caught our attention initially uh, with your first series for the BBC called Five Minutes With, which had you out in front of the world's most recognised faces. Um, you've written for The Telegraph, The Spectator, you hosted sellout live interviews across the country. And most recently, you've been with LBC for the last two and a half years. So let's talk about Five Minutes With. There is a, there's a, I mean, there's a long list of celebrities there that you've interviewed. 219. 219, huge list. More if you count Mitchell and Webb, for example, or Armstrong and Miller, where I interviewed two people for the price of one. And Sesame Street, I noticed. Of course, Sesame Street. Four. Or five. <laughs> yeah, Big Bird. Let's not forget Big of Bird. Course, how can anyone forget? And I'll Elmo, who told that. a joke that went right over me, unfortunately. I was, I was wow. humiliated by the sense of humour of a puppet. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, I, really, I haven't seen that one, but I really, I must catch up and see that one. Um, so you, amongst those, those 219 interviews, you've got a good list there of film stars. Everyone ranging from Danny DeVito to Juliette Binoche, Michael Gambon, Juliette mm. Stevenson, Paul Bettany, Fiona Shaw, uh, Patrick Stewart, Richard Grant, to name a few. 
Um, not necessarily from that list, but from, from the people who have, have been kind of in the film industry, actors or, or directors or, or, or writers. Has anyone sort of given, uh, has anyone impacted you in a way that's been very memorable? Well, I try, as we all do, not to have too many regrets, but one regret for that series was that I didn't manage to interview the great dames of theatre and film. Okay. So Judy Dench oh. and Helen Mirren yeah. and Maggie Smith. I, I think she I assume she is a dame, she of course. Is a dame. These yeah. are unbelievably brilliant actresses, and I would have loved to have met them, and still hope to one day. But I did do a lot of the nights. So Sir Ian McKellen, yes. Sir Patrick Stewart, Sir Ben Kingsley, Sir Michael Gambon. And it was a great privilege to be in their company. Michael Gambon's hands, in case you hadn't noticed. I mean, mine, sadly, are rather stubby. But I've never seen him in real life. So. But they are. He has these wonderfully long, elegant fingers, which are probably part of his success because hands can be so expressive, can't mm. they? And one of the things also struck me about Michael Gambon is that he hangs out with black cab drivers in a little cafe in, in, in London. He's like a man of the people. Mm. And he came up, I, I don't know whether he came up the hard way, but he came up in an unusual way. And he's just a fantastic actor. So talking to him about his craft, about his trade, brilliant. Someone that I think is particularly special is Juliet Stevenson, yes. who was in, I think, Truly Madly Deeply, alongside the late and great Alan Rickman. And she kind of gave me a masterclass, both in that five minutes with, but also when I've done a live, I've done two live events with her, about what it is to be an actor, how, how she does what she does. For example, how do you show grief on screen? or on stage, like how, what, do, what does she tap into? Does she have a, a reservoir of personal experience that she can access? How do you cry when you're on camera? And as she said, it's not a tap, you can't just turn it on. Mm. So a accessing the deeper parts of yourself, I think is really interesting. So she's someone who, she's also in Bend It Like Beckham, of, of course. Of course, how can you forget her as playing Kira Knightley's mum in that? But Juliet Stevenson is, is traditionally, she started as a Shakespearean actress. Um, I'm not sure if she was method trained, but it, she very much went from stage to, to camera. And she's done a really good job to go from stage to screen. Sorry, rather, I should say that. Um, and it's amazing how she's managed to fulfill both and, do, and, and, and be very successful in both realms, I think. And she's, ma you know, she's made that transition and no one's questioned her as a screen actress at all. Like she's been really, really successful. And she does small screen as well as exactly. big screen as well. Exactly. But she would, be, she would have been brilliant. She's always brilliant on stage. I've seen her on stage. Um, never met her, but yeah, she's always been hugely impactful. And Meeting directors as well has been something that has stayed with me. The, the, the late, great Sir Peter Hall, for example, who is this oh. wonderful stage director, and, and Sir Jonathan Miller, who doesn't like being called Sir Jonathan Miller, and who, by the way, coined the phrase Jew-ish when asked, <laughs> that, I think, whether he was Jewish. Well, I'm Jew-ish. I think he's, a, he's very much a secular Jew because he's basically an atheist or an agnostic. And he's an amazing man. In those five-minute interviews, I tried to cram in as many questions as I could within those five minutes and I think the record holder was another unfortunately late great Jackie Collins the the author and sister mm. of Joan Collins and Jackie answered I think 39 questions in in those 300 seconds whereas Sir Jonathan Miller managed to answer only seven he's a really deep wow. thinker 39 versus seven what's your average in five minutes the that's a good question questions you expect to be asking I think if you, if you got, this is about five years ago now, of course, or six years ago, but I think roughly 20 and you'd be kind of happy. Okay. I like to try to get a sense of the person. I, I, I wasn't interested in who they were sleeping with. I wasn't interested in their private <laughs> lives. I wanted to give them a chance to be the best version of themselves, not to be gossipy. Yeah. And by doing that and by being really interested in them, and this goes not just for the actors and actresses and directors, but everybody, I felt we kind of got a sense of who they were, which is an amazing thing in a way, yeah. in, in just five minutes. But Jonathan Miller, I found his description of how he goes about being a director, picking things up on the tube. I also made a documentary with him for the BBC, picking things up on the tube, noticing how people react when they're sad. So when he is directing an opera, because he's famous not just for directing plays, but also operas, and the heroine, the, the soprano, was grieving he would get her just to fiddle with her handkerchief 
because it wasn't all about a massive show of emotion. It was the little details that he picked up, as I say, just from looking at someone perhaps on public transport, and he imported all of that, much as perhaps Juliet Stevenson or other actors and actresses import some of their own personal experiences mm. into how they express oh, themselves absolutely. as actors. Yeah, yes. He imported that into his working life. That's wonderful. And I think that um, there's something disarming about you and your interviews as well, because you have this great big alarm clock, this sort of old school alarm clock with two ringing bells there. I was so Again, pleased when anyone, I found that. For any, for any, um, the uh, giant clock. As Ricky Gervais said when he marched in holding my giant clock, he said, this is a man with a giant clock. <laughs> <laughs> People used to ask me the time on the tube when I carried it with me on the way to interviews. And of course it was always, a, it was always at 5-2, wasn't it? It was always <laughs> at 5-2. I only with... had five minutes. <laughs> and sometimes the alarm might not quite work. I mean, there was a little bit of tension there. But, my, <laughs> but the most famous bit of timekeeping was when I was interviewing Professor Brian Cox at the Science Museum. Yes. And for some reason, there would be these bells that would chime at the museum, or this big gong. And literally at the moment where I pressed the button up to signify the end of the five minutes, and they were really five minutes, but I had to flick the switch up to make it ring, the bell tolled in the Science Musician oh, perfect. Museum. It was, it was very good indeed, yes. Brilliant. But it was quite good to have that gimmick. Yeah. Because Absolutely. it was so recognisable. And these things were appointment to view on the front page of the BBC News website, which was great real estate. Yeah. And then we put them into, five, into, into chunks of five, half-hour TV. So they'd go out on BBC One on Christmas Day at eight in the morning, which was quite a good time yeah. slot. And they'd regularly go out on the BBC News channel. So they reached a lot of people. And people would come up to me sometimes and say, what's the time? Or, look, there's Five Minute Man, which I'm not sure is the best five thing to man. be known mm. for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's enough of the, of the double entendre or the innuendo. Really yes, maybe sort of. But it did give me an idea of time. Like, I think I have a fairly good grasp of time. So on my LBC shows, right at the beginning, if there was some dead air towards the end of the show at sort of quarter, of quarter to five in the morning, and there almost never is anymore because I've got a loyal listenership, and I think I'm quite good, blowing my own trumpet just for a second, <laughs> at persuading no people to, to call in and to take part in conversation because I think they feel that I listen to them and I'm interested in their points of view, which I am, and which, by the way, has been quite a brilliant thing, having spent so many years interviewing celebrities, now interviewing people like you and me, just men and women on the street, and hearing what they've got to say. I think that's one of the brilliant, brilliant things about LBC, but I know my way around the clock. I know how much five minutes is, I know how much five, 15 minutes is. In fact, I once had to speak for 45 minutes on LBC at the very beginning of my career there, how without a single that? caller, interrupted only by a couple of ad breaks. It's a very good question. I think you probably have to ask my listeners That's how successful I was at it, yeah. <laughs> but you don't always have to have calls. If you've got something to say, <laughs> if you're interested in what you're talking about, and if you can talk to your audience of tens, hundreds of thousands as if you are just talking to Jules, then it can kind of work. It doesn't, you don't have to have a show jam-packed full of other voices. But the risk, of course, is that you end up talking a bit too intimately about yourself. And, and then people can think that's self-indulgent. And as soon as it becomes too much about you people switch off. They want just enough. Some they people do like that, though. Some people they do, do like a bit of personality. The, well, that's the point, and getting that it's balance right. Mm. As with so many things in life, you have to get the balance right, because too much about yourself, and it's a switch off, too little, and people don't think that you're really trusting them and bringing them in. Mm. Um, you grew up in Notting Hill, and you still live there. You haven't left. <laughs> Have you? Just to be clear, I don't live with my parents. <laughs> no, 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 of course, of course. But you love, you love, you very much love Notting Hill. And I know that it's, it was a great privilege for us for you to come outside of the park to have this podcast over here. Not very far. In North London. No, it's true. Um, but actually, there's been a recent backlash I've seen in, in a lot of the news, local newspapers, anyway, uh, of, of, and uh, grievances that the local residents have felt because of the film, the impact of the film on the tourism in the area. What's it like living in Notting Hill and having tourists and uh, around everywhere and taking pictures of your house? Have you felt that too? I'm not sure what Hugh Grant thought it was like, because he <laughs> lived there for a little bit. But he moved way after the film. Uh, he moved way after the film, he? but then people would come up to him on Portobello Road and be not surprised to see him, as though this is really where he did live. Shop, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but of course he did for a little bit live there. Mm. I think some, some residents probably don't like the fact that there are so many people on Portobello Road and they just want to go and get their coffee on a Saturday morning. I love it. I love being at the centre of 
things, it being a hub, it's exciting. I like the diversity of it. There's still diversity in the area, perhaps not as much as there was when I was growing up. But in terms of, as you say, the tourism, yeah, there's people from every pocket of the world on a Saturday particularly. But I love Notting Hill. Nothing I re- you change. Well, I, I would have liked the area to have held on to a bit more of its diversity than it has done. But you go up to the Goldbourne Road and there are still there's still a thriving Moroccan community, Moroccan British community. There's I think still a thriving Spanish and Portuguese communities there. There is still a thriving Anglo West Indian community. I mean it's it's alive, it's still fun, but it's perhaps a little bit less bohemian and a little bit less mixed than it was when I was growing up. You you don't get so many sort of eccentrics standing on the end of the end of a road offering you pistachio nuts and, and engaging you in conversations about film which by the way we are not talking enough about this is very true. but I do remember watching the film Notting Hill being made back in 1997 I think it was and my little brother who must then have been only about 11 went up managed to sneak under the security cordon un, uh, under the, the the gaze of the security card who by the way featured in the film himself as Julia Roberts in character bodyguard and she, he managed to, to go up to Julia Roberts and ask her for her autograph. And she wrote a little note saying, Dear Tommy, peace, Julia, which it's went down sweet. in the annals of Stadlin family history. But it was so exciting watching. We watched the whoopsie daisy scene when Hugh Grant, I thought oh, rather yes. dangerously, had to climb over this spiked yeah. fence, which has now changed. I see people when I'm in Notting Hill, sort of drunk on a Saturday night, trying to climb over to the whoopsie daisy. Not a good idea at all. No. And no, there was for a while. Pretty sharp. They're pretty sp- sharp. You can imagine what that might happen to a man or to a woman. <laughs> but for quite a long time, I think there were sort of film tours around the area. Anyway, I was I have to say, back in 97 as a 17 year old a long time ago sadly now, it felt like an exciting place to be. The attention on the area. People would sort of get out of black cabs at what used to be 192, the restaurant there where I made the coffee for a little while just to be seen in the area. It's not quite like that anymore, but it was good fun. And it was a fun film, wasn't it? It was a I, I watched that film Boy, in the current... It's a lot of boxes, and I think everyone, you know, someone who's ill, hungover, young, old, oh, everyone... Yeah. You it know, was feel-good. It's a feel-good film. I watched it in the coronet, which was featured in the film. And so when we saw ourselves as an audience, when we saw the coronet featured in the film, as we were watching the film, this is all very meta, in the coronet, we all gave ourselves a round of applause. Growing up... You're tell, telling me about growing up watching Notting Hill. I still haven't grown up, Jules, you know that. <laughs> what films inspired you, or is there any film that particularly um, resonates with you and you know, gets you thinking about your childhood, reminds you of your childhood? Well, one of the great films I watched when I imagine I was still a teenager was Les Miserables, which is not the musical, but was a, it was a twist on the Victor Hugo story, but mm-hmm. about Jews escaping from... The Holocaust, and that left a very deep impression on me as someone with Jewish roots, whose yeah. grandparents on my father's side did escape just that. But I think more than any one particular film, and I love thrillers like Harrison Ford's movies, The Fugitive and Patriot Games. Okay. I loved Indiana all that. Indiana Jones? Not as much, but a bit, okay. yes. Okay. But so you like the slightly more political, sort of politically charged kind of thing? Or, or... Well, I like the thrillers just for a bit of escapism and then films with a political message with a small p because I think if, if a film is too overtly political it can lose you the films that are really strong politically are the ones that whose, whose messages are not laid on necessarily too thick mm. but more than any one film growing up I think what I remember most as a most special thing for me was that after my grandfather died who had been a concert pianist and premiered the Webern variations in pre-Nazi Berlin, I think, in the 1930s. He was Viennese. When he died in 1996, for about a year, my grandmother and I would go to a classical music concert every week, because until he died, right up until his death, pretty much in his mid-80s, they, my grandmother, Heidi, and him, would go to watch a classical, go to a classical music concert about four times a week. So I stepped into his shoes, not four times a week, but once a week. And I loved doing that with my grandmother, who was my best friend at the time. But then we thought, actually, hang on. Let's trade the classical music concert for the cinema. And so the next year, pretty much every week or every other week, mm. we would go to a cinema like, I think it's called The Screen on the Hill or The Everyman in Belsize Park mm. or wherever it was, and we'd go and watch a movie together. And we loved it. And we saw some really brilliant films together, like, like. Cidade de Dios, 
city of God, which was set, I think, in oh, the favelas absolutely. of Brazil, yeah. Yeah. where you had these kids who were like four, five, six, maybe seven years old, who were causing absolute yeah. carnage. And, and, and it these was these children were really from the favelas. It was like a window into this world that felt so unfamiliar. And yet this very morning, I read a piece on one of the news websites about how knives are being found in the possession of seven-year-old mm. Brits or Londoners. And you think, my goodness, how, how things are changing in our own environment. Absolutely. But th that sort of film, which was so poignantly and brilliantly told, it was a really brutal ex expose of how difficult life can be for some people and how children as young as five or six or seven can end up doing so much damage. It was, it was rather like, what, what's the famous book about... I've forgotten the book. Is it, what is it called? Um, you know, where they, all, where they go and hunt the pig. Oh, Lord of the Flies. Yeah, yeah. It was, in a sense, an echo of Lord of the Flies, the famous book. Yes. A, a question Carnage. about... Yeah, Carnage. Carnage, but also, can children be bad? Yeah. And what does it take for children yeah. to act in bad ways? So I found an ex that, that as an example of a yeah. film that I found. So I love, I love films that really ask us, ask us to ask questions of ourselves. And what topics and themes do you, would you like to see explored more in movies? I mean, I know on your LBC show, you know, you address a lot of socio-economic political issues. Um, is there anything... Because how important do you think film is uh, as a tool for social change? I think it's important. I thought it was really interesting for this year's Oscar seasons that a lot of the films were maybe directed by a, a female director in some cases or are very much about female issues, female empowerment. And it may or may not have been a reaction to the Me Too movement, because some of these films, no doubt, were in production or, or, or being thought about for years, predating the Me Too movement. Yeah. But you think of something like The Favourite. Of course. Which was to three an women as three, and it was to an extent about lesbianism or yeah. being a gay woman. And I think it's very important that things like that are explored and that there are more roles for women and that women's issues are explored. If you think about... Roma, which um, really swept up at the Oscars, the lead role is a, is a woman there. Uh, as well. So I think it's important that issues and experiences are explored. I think it's also important that there are roles for women. If you think about even Shakespeare, how many roles for how many f genuinely powerful female roles are there in Shakespeare? Not very many. Mm -hmm. Something I've talked about with Juliet Stevenson in the past is how there haven't been traditionally enough roles for women after they get beyond a certain age. I think that might just about be starting to change and that is now being reflected in the movie industry, probably reflected in Hollywood. But it is also important to say that for a film to be successful, it can't just take an important issue and hit you over the head with it. It has, to, it has to be a compelling story and, and it has to be compellingly way, told yes. yeah. and delivered. And a film like The Favourite, which I thought was an important film and I thought was beautifully shot, for me, I didn't think, and this is very personal, of mm. course, for me, I didn't think that the storytelling was good enough. It didn't grip me. It didn't kind of pick me up out of my seat and shake me. What has picked you up out of your seat and shaken you? Uh, you're going to laugh at me. You'll probably mock me, Jules, but films like the Marigold Hotel films. The best exciting yeah. Marigold now, Hotel. I thought, <laughs> you see, you're laughing. You see, I was laughing and crying. And in the second film particularly, I was in the cinema with my wife and I was crying almost all the way through. For a man who can be vulnerable, well, you know, well, I, I don't, I, it's things that are perhaps what more... What is it about it? Well, Things that are more surprise, surprisingly engage my emotions than, than the obvious, it, where it's not laid on too thick, where it, that there is a poignancy about it, where it really is somehow a, 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 a window a or a door into these... About... It's about the poignancy of old age and about <laughs> how you can find love in, and, and companionship in old age. But there was also so much humour. A really great film, for me, is often one where you can laugh and cry in equal measure. And, and it doesn't have to be obviously sad... To, make, to, to bring the tears to my eyes. I thought it was brilliantly acted as well. If, something, if people are really inhabiting the parts that they play, think of, think of Bill Nye and I think Judy Dench in those films, or at least in one of those yeah. films, they were so brilliantly done. The other thing, I, by, by the way, that I loved about it was the atmosphere and the ambience, and you get quite a lot of that in films like films that are set maybe in the Midwest or in the Rust Belt in America, but a film that transports you to a different part of the world where you really feel part of the landscape. An example of that, by the way, and this isn't film, this is, this is 
television, True, True Detective, the first series of True Detective. Oh, it's brilliant. It, because it's, I don't think set in Louisiana. Yeah. And the third series, by the way, Woody was Harrison set in Arkansas. Exactly. Yeah. The third series set in Arkansas. You that really inhabit that course, space. Uh, You're dragged into Marsh, it. Marshall Ali. Uh, Genius. He's fantastic. He's won two he Oscars won now. Yeah. Three, I think. Has he won three? He's won wow. the best supporting. Yeah. Well, he's just an extraordinary actor. And, and so Marigold Hotel, because it was so believable where it was set, I imagine, I hope it was set, actually set in India. It was set in India, but it was filmed, I'm sure, filmed in India. It, it was just deeply compelling. Something, uh, I'd like to know something that you really recommend that you've seen really, really recently. I don't know how to pronounce it to my shame, okay. but Kapanam or Kapanorm. Kapanorm, okay, yes. I think it's, directed it's by, yeah. yeah, directed by a Leb Lebanese director, yeah. certainly set in Beirut. I don't know whether it was filmed in Beirut. It and was, it was filmed in Beirut. Apparently they found a real life young boy, Syrian refugee, they did. and they turned him into a star. And now, Zane Al Rifa, he was 12 or 13 when it was filmed. It's a homemade film. Her, uh, uh, Nadine Labaki's husband, uh, was that she, actually the producer. I was just rocked to the core by the sheer brutality of it and by the hopelessness of it and by the destructiveness mm. of it and about the, just the, sh the suffering of and the bleakness experienced by kids, for God's sake, in, 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 in the Zane, contemporary like world. Zayn al Rifa again, is a child, a bit like the children in City of God. He's a ch he's, he's, he was just a Syrian refugee. He wasn't an actor. So he was a re and his actual name is Zayn. The actor, the, in fact, that's his, that's his but real name. Here was a, a film that wasn't hitting you around the, the head with an overtly political message, but just through the, your shared experience of what this kid was going through. Repeatedly, you were being punched in the face by the suffering he experienced. In the end, I just broke down because I couldn't believe that a child, and there are probably millions of children like this around the world, who are forced to go out and make money for their families. I mean, I saw it on the streets of South American countries in South America when I was 19 and traveling around there. But the, the fact that this was brought so powerfully to our minds, I just kind of, it just really, really rocked me. And I left that cinema wanting to change the world, okay? And I know that sounds naff. But I wanted to make a difference. I thought, how can I, how can I change things in a more impactful way than I can by having conversations on LBC? What can I do to help people or to, 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 to carry on that message, to do something? It's specifically you're talking about Syria? Not just Syria, whatever it is in the world. How can you make a difference when there is, so, when there is such a contrast between privilege and, and suffering? But I also left that cinema talking to my wife, who came out, with, came out of it with a different feeling to me. Of course, she recognised the brutality and the sadness, but she pointed out and emphasised the hope and the goodness. Those were the things that made the biggest impact, I think, on her. And she was right. There is, in that darkest set of circumstances, unbelievable goodness and resilience shining through. And I'm not going to give away the ending, yeah. but there is, there's hope. And that's really, really important to be left with, I think. Yeah, well, Shawshank and Redemption, a very different film with oh, Morgan Freeman. You film. sit through that film, and again, it is just relentlessly brutal, but it works as a film because it teaches you the value or reminds you of the value of hope. Even, even in the most miserable circumstances, if you can hold on to hope, then you're still alive. So that's your latest uh, recommendation for people to go and see. And I think it's a is top tip. Absolutely, it's in uh, Kapanel, um, and it's still, I think it's still in the cinemas right now. Um, and you are bringing out a book at the end of the year. Towards the end of the year, I, at the moment Can you in tell October. Can you a bit about that, please? This is a book called How to See Birds, and it is How to See Birds. No pun intended for <laughs> the sexists out there. This is actually about the flying birds. With wings. And with feathers. wings and feathers. And, and where, how, how did this come about? This came about because as a little boy, I, was, I fell in love with the idea of bird watching through my uncle who used to look after peregrine falcon's nests. And he took me up to the highlands and we saw golden eagles mm. and we saw ospreys. So it's something you've always Something I've always had, but sort of dipped in and out of. And then when I left the BBC, and left my staff role there. I had more time on my hands juggling my sort of portfolio career, writing my interview column at The Telegraph and then LBC. And I married two passions of mine, photography and bird watching, and started to take photographs of birds. And I taught myself sufficiently for them to be publishable and found a publisher and the publisher 
is now going to publish it. And it's basically a book of my birds and my stories of how you can see and share everyday beauty around you. Let's all use our eyes. We look forward to seeing that. That's out later later this year. I think the launch is in October. Is that right? Amazing, Matt. Thank you. And finally, just to just before we sign off, um, three films that if someone hasn't seen um, that they should see that we've discussed today. So if we say most recently, Capernaum. Capernaum, The Hundred Foot Journey. With Aaron, Aaron. Very sentimental, but great fun. And I defy you not to shed some tears during that. And that's about it's Helen Mirren, who runs a Michelin style restaurant. And it's an Indian family who have been displaced from their home country and via other places in Europe arrive in, I think, I imagine the south of France, certainly somewhere okay. beautiful, rural French. Okay. And, and it's about the journey of this young Indian guy who wants to be a top chef. A chef, I'll leave it Wonderful. at that. Wonderful, lovely premise. Very inspiring. And finally, yes. well, Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. Uh, let me give you those two films just in case you haven't seen right. them. Not everyone loves okay. them, but I did. Thank you very much, Matt. Thanks, Jules.